just wanted to make sure that everyone knows that this is a map presentation. I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm not part of UFI as extension anymore. And this does not have the A&M logo because this is a, a, a map presentation. So I'm not speaking on behalf of Texas A&M AgriLife either I'm doing this. I'm just doing this as a, as a former agent uh, and current ag agent, but not for any specific uh, entity. Uh, but I'm sure they wouldn't argue with what I'm saying because everything I'm saying here is research-based and everything. Um, and a lot of the stuff from uh, from Florida that was done on, uh, okay, let's see here. Oh, there we go. On, uh, on oh, there we go. Got it. I got it. Oh, I forgot to that. That logo's still there. Oh, okay. That's all right. So, um, so what, what happened was uh, in back in when Hume, uh, Hume was the president of University of Florida and uh, he inspired everybody. He was a inspirational figure in the University of Florida, um, kind of brought the, uh, the whole university from a small agricultural college into the 20th century as he's, that was really his job. He was a president of the University of Florida for a little while, but he, he also in 1938 was a dean of the College of Agriculture. So he had a lot to say, but he was a big rose enthusiast and a gardener. And he came up with a book called Gardening the Lower South, which was uh, a, the Bible for gardening in Florida up until the 1980s. And it still is a great book. It's There are people now publishing it um, outside of the realm of legality that you so you can buy it on amazon.com okay but the if you want an official edition you'll have to go back and get something the last printing was 1979 so um but you can still find those old copies they circulate pretty regularly um so so as we know with the cultivated roses there were there are a lot of um with cultivated roses there's a lot of history there and a lot of different breeding has gone on uh, in with roses uh, dating back to the Roman period. And, and a lot of the Roman roses were spread across Europe and were bred uh, by the Romans and then uh, were grown by the churches because the churches viewed the roses as medicinal. They didn't quite grow roses for flowers, even though they did enjoy the flowers. They, they grew the roses for the hips, which are the fruit production areas of the roses, the hips are. So the hips are, are, are very high and rich in vitamin C. And, you know, strangely enough, these days we take vitamin C for granted in a way. We say, oh, everything has drinks of orange juice, of course. We drink... Uh, Blue, you know, smoothies, we eat blueberries, we eat potatoes. Lots of things have vitamin C, uh, collards, you know, and such. But what in the past, you know, the Middle Ages, vitamin C was a rare nutrition. So people would get uh, diseases because, like scurvy, because they didn't have enough vitamin C in their diet. And so they'd go to the church's apothecary, which was someone who would, would be someone who is considered knowledgeable on medicines. And that person would share uh, rose hip tea or or rose hip jelly or something that would provide the vitamin C necessary and cure the disease. And then, of course, or cure the disorder, really. It's more not really a disease, but a disorder, nutritional disorder. And, of course, wow, you you this person would be cured. And everyone would say this person is an amazing apothecary because they provided a cure for this disorder, unbeknownst to the apothecary the component uh was vitamin c but they thought it it came from the rose hips so they thought rose hips were great medicine so they grew these roses and then in china you had uh people breeding roses from thousands of years ago you had these wonderful breeders in china that are depicted in ancient artwork um that bred roses for all of the royal courts and the and, and the roses were spread across China in the many thousands of years that this took place. 
And so you had roses all over most of the known world at the time, or the, the known, oh, what we call the Western and Eastern world of the uh, great civilizations of history that were, I would say, had written languages and such. And except for the, you know, the, we call, what you call the, the, um, the America continents, so North and South America, actually, in North America, there are native roses. There aren't any in South America, but all native roses are uh, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere. There are no roses native to the Southern Hemisphere. However, you can grow roses in the Southern Hemisphere, and there are some great rose breeders both in Australia and India um, at this time. But it's, they're just not native to those areas. But they do grow there perfectly well. Um, so what, what I was just saying here about these this history of these roses is that um, what happened to make roses into a uh, a uh, everyone can hear me fine correct um, just to make make sure that that the roses were were bred at this time um, and, and created into a flower that we know today because they were considered more medicinal at the time and then in China they were considered flowers but they used them mostly for landscaping not necessarily for cut flowers. So how did we get to the roses that we have today? Well, what happened was was uh, people started doing trading from Europe to China and the Middle East, which also had its own set of roses that were used for rose oil, okay, that was used to perfume and for cooking. And so what you had is this trading apparatus. And so roses were traded to you know to to sellers that would bring them to Europe and they would breed with the current European roses that were used for medicine and they would create these wonderful uh, floral roses these beautiful cut flower roses that would bloom repeatedly and you ended up getting a roses in the class of bourbon and and hybrid perpetual and noisette and then as things kept going on you kept getting more breeding and then all of a sudden they created the hybrid tea and the polyantha in the 1920s uh was developed which was one of the first shrub roses like a drift series and then the floribunda and grandiflora and now we have lots of different types of roses uh miniature roses shrub roses long stem roses just a huge array of different roses so here's just a little classification of the genus rose, all the different species that were brought in to breed the old garden roses, that's what we call roses introduced before 1867. And those include the China, the tea, the noisette, bourbon, and uh, many other mystery roses. I put there Bermuda mystery because in Bermuda, there are a lot of roses that are considered mystery roses, but they, they'll fit into those other classes, of course. And then the modern roses that were bred after 1867, we call the floribundas, the hybrid teas, the polyanthus, and the shrubs. Uh, and so there's so many classes. Um, you, you know, there's so many classes. That, uh, what, what, we, what in Florida, what we can grow easily is roses from the China class because the the climate they were developed in is very similar to the climate of Florida, I would say, uh, north to central Florida, especially. And they do especially well in those areas. Um, they There's so many different kinds of China roses. There's 30 or 40 different ones that are, are in cultivation to pink to like old blush as pictured there. The reddish color like Louis Philippe, that's considered red, even though today it's they've developed darker reds, but the, that was the standard for red at the time. Uh, and then mutabilis, which the name uh, translates into immutable. It, it changes color from peach to pink as the flower ages, and it's also known as the butterfly rose. They're very extremely disease resistant. Uh, it is a really nice rose, um, mutabilis. And there's Duché. Some people mentioned they grew Duché, which is a wonderful white china. Some might grow Contes de Kayla. Uh, that's a China tea hybrid. Uh, Archduke Joseph is a 
um, excuse me, Archduke Charles is a more dark, is a darker version of Old Blush that's a little more vigorous, you know. So you have lots of nice China roses. I could name some more like White Pet and Pink Pet and uh, Lamar. No, no, that's a, I mean, not Lamar. Um, I'm trying to think of one other, um, one other one, but there, there are quite a few other ones. Uh, that are not uh, nice China roses. Look the green of Flora. They really do well all throughout Florida. They love hot climates. You can't really grow them too much north of 7B because of their cold hardiness. They're not very cold hardy, so they end up um, getting getting zapped by cold weather um, when it's too when you're too far north. But they really enjoy Zone 8A, Zone 8B. 9A, 9B, and they are vigorous. They are free flowering. They have larger flowers. Some have long stems. Some have high centers. And we're getting closer to the florist rows of today, but not quite there. And they repeat, like I said, repeat bloom well. They were grown throughout the southern United States and the Gulf South very, very frequently. Um, and they do very well in Florida. So if you're going to grow an old garden rose, try, try some of the teas. There are a number of nice nurseries in Florida that sell the, the old teas, such as Angel Gardens is one and uh, in no particular order, Rose Petals Nursery, Reverence for Roses. Um, then we have Anti Grows Emporium in Texas, and we have uh, Roses Unlimited in uh, South Carolina. Burlington Rose Nursery, and I believe they're in Washington State, I believe, and and there are quite a few a few others scattered throughout the country, mail order sources. But the ones in Florida, you can go and make an appointment and pick up roses. And I would highly recommend also consulting with Florida Southern College, uh, Dr. Malcolm Manners and his program because they often have rose sales. So you can get roses from them and they grow, they have a rose garden in uh, Lakeland, Florida show that shows off a lot of the really great, uh, easy to grow cultivars. So that's worth a, worth a visit, of course, worth a visit. Some of my favorite uh, teas um, um, were developed um, into climbers by crossing with uh, Rosa Gigantea and and the musk rose, and you end up with some of the climbing tea roses. Um, and you have the noisette class from that. And uh, they they can be very large plants, large sprawling shrubs into uh, roses that need to be trained on trellises, but they're very easy to grow. They're very uh, floriferous. And uh, as you can see from the one pictured here, that's one called uh, Kaiser and Friedrich. Also, they believe now that one called E. Viriot Hermanos, I'm really butchering the name, okay, is also the same as Kaiser and Friedrich. Uh, it can be ordered. It's a nice, large flowered apricot colored noisette. And then you have the shrub type noisettes like blush noisette that were developed really early in the 1800s. And they produce large shrubs or climbing roses. You can really train them however you wish. And they have huge clusters and intense hey, perfume. Hey, Matt, can they... I interrupt you for a yes. second? Sure. Um, this noisette class, um, the fragrance of it, is it more of the spicy? Is that like that Bermuda spice kind of rose? That's a very good question. So Bermuda spice, I'm glad you mentioned Bermuda spice. I'm going to mention it later, but... It is a uh, a Bermuda mystery rose, and it's also thought to be one of the early tea roses. Okay. And it has a spicy scent. And some of the noisettes that are derived from the tea side will have the spicy scent, like the one on top, the Kaiser and Friedrich. But down at the right. bottom, you have blush noisette and some of the earlier noisettes that were derived from the Chinas and the musk rose. And those will be, have a honey, extremely strong honey scent. Ooh, nice. Okay, thanks, and Matt. So so, sorry for the interruption. Different. No, that's fine. Thank you. Always interrupt if you have a 
pressing question. But the, the noisette classes, there's two different types of noisettes, even though they're in the same class. Genetically, they're very different um, because the the sprawling climbers that grow on trellises with the large flowers really are closer related to the teas, whereas the uh, the bushy climbers that tend to climb but also form really dense shrubs are related to the musk rose, Rosa machata, and the chinas. So it's they have some similarities and some differences, but they're both great to grow. And there's quite a few. There's probably twenty or thirty types available. Uh, Easily, readily available with some ease, especially with the Florida, the nurseries in Florida. You have to, if you're going to get want some roses, they sell out so fast and they're shipping all over the country. The best thing to do is call the nursery, say, I'm from Florida. Um, I would like to see what you'll have in stock that's not on the catalog and and get some get some roses that are, um, you know, maybe a little too small to ship that they would be able to, to, uh, to get you, if they say they're out of stock on the website, they might have stock if you call and we're willing to go there and pick them up. Uh, but the people from all over the country are buying these roses so fast that the companies can barely keep up with the demand to treat. There's, there's some room in the industry for more participants. Um, polyanthus, um, the polyanthus are, are uh, some of my favorite roses. They're, the drift roses are very closely related to the polyanthus. Uh, there are new varieties of drift roses introduced. There's probably 10 different types now. They're the low-growing, free-flowering, easy-to-grow shrubs. And the polyanthus are really the start of that trend in the 1880s, but they were very popular in the 1920s. And the one I show here is called Pearl d'Or, which means golden pearl in French. And it's, a, it's very closely related to um, Rosa multiflora. And they tend to be uh, very free flowering and very um, easy to grow and colorful, uh, mostly in the pinks, but you get some oranges and some yellows as well. And uh, one of my favorite polyanthus is called Cecile Bruner, which is very close to Pearl d'Or. It's a very nice pink rose. Uh, Floribundas came about because people wanted, in the 50s, they wanted some showy roses that were Pre-flowering, showy, but also had really uh, aesthetically pleasing large flowers. So they started with the Floribunda, and the heyday for Floribundas was the 1950s and 1960s, where there was thousands introduced. The ones I show here are um, Dusky Maiden at the top. Uh, then I have Nimbus, which is really hard to find. I no longer have it, but it's it's that lavender one. And then I have one that's easy to find called Valentine, which is the best one of the best Floribundas ever developed. If you if you want a rose like knockout but stays two feet tall and has a more velvety flower texture, then try Valentine. Uh, it's was bred in 1950 and it's a really nice Floribunda. And then of course your hybrid teas from the for, that are very popular with long stem cut roses, and we have My Choice featured there. And bottom is Maria Stern. And they do really well um, in in areas that have low humidity. But in Florida, they have trouble with our uh, black spot issues. And you really have to be uh, care, uh, someone who really is good at spraying roses on a regular basis to grow a lot of the hybrid teas, with a few exceptions, of course. Uh, some of the nice shrubs we can grow without spraying, like is for example Belinda's Dream, and Belinda's Dream really produces a wonderful large flowers and uh, Belinda's dream is a nice shrub rose but it really responds to a pruning so if you're going to grow Belinda's dream um, I would suggest you know giving it plenty of space and planting it in it likes to be planted in groups of three you can get a really nice display doing that um, and and but don't be afraid in February or January probably down south it would be January 1st up in the panhandle will be February 1st to 15th. It's giving them a good pruning um, down to about uh, two feet high and cutting out any of the dead wood. And if you do that, you're going, you're going to get a, a lot of flowers in the spring and a lot of new growth and, um, and new canes. If you neglect the pruning too much, you might get a leggy bush that 
that kind of overgrows itself and gets too woody and it no longer produces large amount of flowers. So Melinda's Dream is one of those roses that really loves pruning, which a lot of the old garden roses don't like being pruned. So that's where you need to know what you're growing if you're going to be successful with, with roses. Um, you know, there's climbers, you know, this is an old climber called Richmond and it's a, I grew it for fragrance only. It's not very much of a flower, but the fragrance is really nice. But there are lots of nice climbers out there. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hume, he, he uh, recommends these, these climbing roses, all of which are now available again. Uh, they just found Solfaterre. We're in Marie Henriette. It's kind of hard to find, but it's, uh, if you want something for, for South Florida where it's, you know, really... Uh, warm in the in the winter and, and humid, you might try Bell Portuguese. Uh, Bell Portuguese is a light pink that doesn't like cold. It's very cold tender, but it loves South Florida, along with Fortune's Double Yellow. Uh, Devoniensis would be another one um, for South Florida. Uh, if you're in Central Florida, you can try uh, Rosa Banksia or uh, Chromatella Devoniensis again. Um, uh, Mammon Coche climbing versions of, of it are, are quite stunning. Uh, another, you know, there's some others like uh, Cramoise Superior, too, and that's some nice ones. And some of the shrubs uh, on the list, um, I mentioned Cecile Brunner Pearl Or if you're in South, around here in North Florida or South Florida, Lady Hillingdon is just stunning. Um, Duchess de Brabant. Uh, Safrano is great in North Florida. It's it, it's 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 really beautiful apricot rose, but what makes it distinctive to me is is it's uh it's purple new growth maroon purple color on the new growth, which is quite quite striking on its own. It's one of those roses that's kind of slow to establish, and you might get angry with it, and then all of a sudden it starts growing into a massive rose bush. Um. Uh, Madame Lombard, Mary Van Hout, um, Louis Philippe, of course, and then of course Fred Carl Druschke, which I found in my time in Chipley, found that growing in a lot of home, homes, older homes. It's a white white shrub rose that can also climb. It's very nice. So you can find an array of different roses. Um, uh, make sure that you plant, you give your rose plenty of space, and research the mature size because what what I have often found is in in roses is some people may get a small plant and put them close together. So you end up with, you know, say, uh, them two, one or two feet apart. And these roses need to be six to eight feet apart to give them plenty of space. So don't crowd the roses. Uh, is it resistant to disease? Research that. Can it tolerate heat and drought? Uh, especially at Tex in Texas, can it tolerate drought? That's what they did when Texas A&M created the EarthKind program. They were trying to test roses and, and let people know which roses would grow with minimal watering. Um, and there's some that could make it and some that couldn't. Uh, but in that case, you'd have to only water your landscape, you know, twice a week. And the roses were tested on drip irrigation. And to make, the, make it more extreme, they reduced it to once a week once the roses were established. So you had roses that were surviving on very little irrigation and doing very well. And that program is getting revived at A&M uh, with some new, new trials and new uh, graphics and publications. And, and I'm very excited about that. Um, you have here uh, the polyanthus. Some of the best polyanthus for, for us and for Florida would be uh, Pink Pit, which is often sold as Caldwell Pink. White Pit, Lamarne. I mentioned Lamarne earlier. It's a really nice polyanthus. Seal Bruner and Pearl to Ore. And I put higher fertility. They do like a little more fertilizer, but I discovered something when I dug out the one at, at work. Is it was planted above asphalt, um, a big chunk of asphalt, and that's why it wasn't ever so happy. It grew very nicely, but I had to give it so much more fertilizer and. And part of that reason was because the, the asphalt was interacting and by providing too much calcium 
uh, messing up my fertilization ratio. So uh, now I know why. Uh, but they still like to have the blue morphe fertilizer more. All roses will. Um, China, some of the Chinas I recommended. I mentioned Metabolis before. I mentioned Louis Philippe. Crown was a superior is great as a bush or a climber, especially as a climber. It's stunning if you can find it. Smith Parish and Contest de Kayla, which has a nice yellowish orange rose. And then, of course, Louis Philippe is known to be the standard rose that grows all over the state and pretty much is indestructible in a lot of ways. Uh, some of the nice teas I'd suggest for Florida would be Rosette de, de Lizzy, which is pictured here uh, as a yellow and pink rose. It starts off yellow and fades to it, or enhances, I would say, to a, a, a pink. So you see some flowers will, will fade and get lighter with sunlight, and some enhance themselves. They get darker with sunlight, and, and that's because of the chemical reaction of some of the pigments in the petals when exposed to sunlight. Uh, another one that will darken with the sun exposure is Madame, Madame Antoine Mari and Madame Antoine Reeb. Uh, Mrs. Dudley Cross is a beautiful pink peach one. And Mrs. B.R. Kant is a lovely shrub rose that's quite large in stature. And here's a picture of, um, let's see, this one. I believe is uh, called. Uh, let me check. We think I'll tell you. That should be Orleans, Orleans Rose, I believe, but it's um no, no yeah I believe but anyway, it's a nice rose too. But uh no no that's that's Madame Lombard. That's after when Madame Lombard was very young. Okay. So Monsieur Tillier, Madame Lombard, which when it matures, it's a lot lighter color of plant, but that one was just pruning a very young plant. Safrano, Bonceline, Duchess de Brabant Spice. That's also known as Bermuda Spice. And one called G. Nebonan, which is only available for a few growers, but has a nice long apricot rose on a stem. And of course, Spice, Bermuda Spice is known to be one of the early uh, tea roses. There's no way to know if it's the one brought from China or if it's a close hybrid uh, from the early 1800s. Um, you don't know because in China, they don't have a plant that's known as the the, the Hughes Blush rose, which came out of China. So it's it's an in, it's, uh, introduction and parentage are unknown, but it is a uh, prolific, prolific bloomer with three inch pink flowers and it's very prolific large growing four to six feet wide and about the same in height and it grows here at my place here in Chipley without much care at all it, it uh it's too far from the house to get watered everything else will get watered but it doesn't get watered when it was younger I used to have to water it by a bucket because the hose would just not reach or or I'd have to put a sprinkler on it but uh, it doesn't need watering. It it flowers readily. It doesn't get diseases. It's kind of a spicy fragrant. I highly recommend uh, the spice rose. And Mrs. B. R. Kant is tough as nails. It's a, a very tough rose. It's very um, prolific in bloom and and tough constitution. The the problem with this Mrs. B. R. Kant is it can get very large. Eight by eight, eight by eight feet, and it doesn't like being pruned. So, what they do at the Antique Rose Emporium, for example, is they'll do a light hedge trimming every year to keep it the same size, and remove dead wood and let it kind of fend for itself. And there's just a picture of Mrs. B. Arcand in a garden, and as you can see, it's a lot bigger. A Safrano. Safrano uh, is a really nice, large apricot tea rose. And then, of course, you have Marie Van Hout, which is a a white uh, tea rose, which will blush pink with age, and it's very thorny and horizontal. So you might have a Marie Van Hout rose, which is 
maybe six to seven feet wide, but only three feet tall. That's about right. And I planted a Marie Van Hout rose and a Souvenir de St. Anne rose at one of my churches that I went to uh, back in 2005. And I went by, by there. I, I went to a training, a new agent training in September in College Station, Texas. And I went by my old church. And lo and behold, the roses were planted there in 2005, roughly. And they're still there thriving in the, they don't get any spray. They might get fertilized once a year, if that. And I think the only water they get is from the gutter of a building when it rains. And they are still looking good after all these years. How long is that now? That's what? Almost 20 years, right? Almost. So, um, eight, 18 years, 17 years ago. Uh, Noisettes, uh, Champagne's Pink Cluster is the first. Bush Noisette was the second. And they were strictly crosses from the China roses and the musk rose species, Rosa Moschata, and they produce very fragrant flowers. And the disease-resistant shrubs, they're just usually a white or a light pink. And they started crossing those roses with some of the um, uh, tea roses that were in existence and the Rosa Gigantea, which is a rose that's a very large climber. And they ended up getting some nice ones, such as uh, Reve d'Or, which is pictured below um, Madame Alfred Carrier, uh, and then Celine Forestier, which is also pictured in the, in the middle there. Madame Alfred Carrier is a, a large, fragrant, fragrant white rose. And then they, they bred some of the other roses, like the hybrid teas, and uh, I can't recommend hybrid teas for disease-free production because they'll get black spot. However, you can grow some of the tougher ones and hardier ones with uh, some, a few, a little bit of spraying once in a while. This one called Laughter from the 40s can grow without being sprayed and is a really, uh, advantage is, is it has a nice color, a nice flower. It doesn't need spraying, but the disadvantage is it tends to flower on the tip of very long stems and the thorns are wicked, extremely wicked piercing thorns, which when the plant gets real, real uh, ingrown and you have to do some pruning, it's not fun. Um, and then, of course, Rosa Banksia. We have Alba for white and Lutea for yellow. And this one likes full sun. So all of you with Rosa Banksia and have little tiny plants that are in the shade, that's your problem. They're not getting full sun. They like to be fertilized if you're growing on sandy soil. They need some fertilizer and water. And then you'll have them growing large and covering trees like these in the picture. They're nearly completely disease-free. And I mentioned earlier for the South Florida people, Fortune's Double Yellow. It, it tends to be considered a once-blooming rose. However, the season is several weeks, and it will cover up a wall with its beautiful yellow and copper-colored flowers. Uh, and, of course, Belle Portuguese, uh, Belle of Portugal, with its very fragrant tea scent and vigorous vigorous growth it will really really take over an arbor however be prepared if you try to grow it in north florida be prepared for severe dieback even if it only gets into the mid-20s and some of the shrubs that i really like the knockout series belinda's dream and belinda's blush the basies blueberries are, makes a great a uh, small flowering shrub that's very fragrant. And, of course, the, the Griffith Buck Selection, you might find some good ones there. Um, so there are quite a few um, nice shrubs that we can can uh, get a hold of. Um, Take It Easy is, is known as another one of the new shrubs that's pretty easy to grow related to the Knockout Series. Um, it tends to be pretty good. Uh, Belinda's Dream. Uh, developed by Dr. Basie. We talked about that one already, and it's nice floral capabilities. If you Google Belinda's Dream, you'll see a lot more photos that are show a larger, older plant with more flowers. Knockout. And uh, you know, Knockout's a, a pretty easy shrub, but it grows large, and it's very nice. 
uh, requires the pruning. So if you don't prune knockout, you end up with a woody shrub that ceases to bloom well after about 20 years or so. So good, giving good regular pruning is helpful. And then you have the drift series. This is um would be apricot, not apricot, but more like the orange drift and the white drift, I believe. And here they are. And they're low growing and very free flowering. Um, and they're crossed between the grand cover and the miniature roses, which are in turn crosses from the polyantha roses. And uh, if you don't have to deadhead them if you're in a commercial landscape, but if you do, take trim off the old flowers with a hedge trimmer once in a while, you'll get a whole nother nice display instead of those uh, spent flowers spending their time creating hips. Okay. And then, uh, of course, the the BR, this is from the, the study that Gary Knox did a while back with Dr. Matthews Parrott. And they said that the best performers from the statewide study were Mrs. B.R. Kant, Spice, Louis Philippe, and Knockout. And so, um, oh, old Hume, Mr. Hume, Dr. Hume, I say old Hume because I feel like I almost know the guy, even though I've, I've read his stuff, even though I've never met him, of course. but. He has such good good writings, uh, but he says that rose time in the lower south comes in spring and again in autumn, which makes sense because he's saying that roses do well in the spring and autumn. They're flowering, but in the summer, that's so dry, can be so dry or just wet and and without enough sun, so they and the heat comes on, so they just quit producing flowers for a while. And so, um, so he he recommends. Also, that too much shade is really bad for the roses. They like uh, six hours minimum a day, minimum, and they would prefer the minimum come from the, uh, I would say, the uh, the eastern morning exposure and allow them to be in some shade during the afternoon. That helps them withstand some heat a little better. Um, also, he says that tree roots can be a big problem um, with with roses because of the oaks, the laurel oak, the water oak, the camphor, and the magnolia will send roots in, will send roots into raised beds and and cause lots of trouble, um, and and really rob from your roses and eventually kill them. You wonder why your roses are dead. You'll dig a hole, and you'll find they're encased by oak roots that are eating off of their nutrient system and and irrigation. Um, we talked about pruning earlier. Um, so if you have four soils, raised beds are good and some organic um, amendments and some drip irrigation will make you even happier because you're not getting the leaves wet when you irrigate. That means less fungal spores splashing around on the leaves. So uh, drip irrigation translates into a better, uh, healthier growing area. So he, he was roses. Um, when he was growing roses, he didn't have access to any of the modern fungicides. All he used were the copper and sulfur fungicides, which had limited success, but did work for his purposes. Um, uh, one thing about his his roses is, if you look at most of the roses introduced in the 1920s when his book was written, they no longer exist. But the ones he wrote about are still for the most part in cultivation and that gives it evidence and credence to their reliability and his selection was was good because they it was stood the test of time and he's his theme was that he wanted to promote roses that were easy to care for so that the, so that the average home gardener would have fun at growing roses and not consider it a chore um just a little bit of nutrient overview the first thing I always say in extension is get a soil test, get a soil test, get a soil test. And then um, once you review the soil test, uh, you could decide what fertilizer you want to use. You always end up wanting to use some nitrogen and potassium. So even if you don't do a soil test, you could get an 808, which would tell you most likely be, be that would what is what the soil test will tell you to put out because uh, of, of the soil you have, and they know, or they know a lot about the soil, so they can estimate that. But they'll do an official test for you. But um, but um, the thing is, is is if you don't have phosphorus, 
in the fertilizer, the middle number. So the first number is nitrogen, the middle number is phosphorus, and the third number is potassium. A lot of fertilizers don't have phosphorus because phosphorus is an excess nutrient in Florida soils, in many Florida soils, and can cause runoff, which would cause algal blooms in lakes and 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 rivers and canals. So in order to get phosphorus, you have to have a, a soil test that shows that you need phosphorus. Like out here in the sand hills in northern Florida here, south of me, about 15 miles where I'm at today, um, they have the um, the sand hills that have sugar sand and the soil has no nutrients, including phosphorus. So in that case, you'd have a soil test and then you'd be legally al allowed to put out phosphorus. Another good thing is um, slow release fertilizers that spoon feed the roses through the season instead of just all at once where most of that's lost. And uh, commercial or or chemical fertilizer both have the same nutrients, but the delivery is different. The the um, organic fertilizer is a lot slower at delivery and less chances of runoff, and it helps build the soil. So you have kind of a combination of both that you can use that are affordable. Roses love compost, and they love a combination of different fertilizers. You get a little bit of different nutrient uptake and it makes for a more well-rounded and healthy plant. Um, there's your fertilization rates. If you have a test that shows you need phosphorus, you can triple eight uh, once a month from March until mid-October and about a half a cup per plant per application. And try to keep your pH between five and a half and six. If you can, uh, if you can't, you can, that's understandable, but uh, it'd be good to have that pH right in that range, and then you'll have more luck at, at uh, growing roses. Um, so, slow release can be applied every two months, depending on the label. But if we're having an extremely hot month, you could go back to applying that once a month because they, in the in the hot months, they release their fertilizer faster. So there could be a period where you don't have enough fertilizer. Um, apply it with compost or manure to help with the organic matter in the soil so you don't deplete that. And also, if you do use mushroom compost, be careful of how much you use because the pH is very high and it might need some, some additional composting with your normal leaf litter or clippings. So what do you think this is on the oldest leaves? What deficiency? Give them a minute, Matt. Any ideas? Uh, can I guess or no? Sure, why not? I'm going to say magnesium. You're exactly right. Magnesium. Uh, Maria, because... Hold on. Maria Jones also said magnesium. Good. Right. That's great. Because, because if you, if you uh, have magnesium deficiency what will happen is the old leaves will start turning yellow first on the margins because magnesium is a mobile nutrient it moves where it's needed in the plant so those old they know those old leaves the plant knows that those old leaves will be will fall off with the winter time so or if your roses stay green all the time they'll shed later uh, in, the, in the spring and so that's a deficiency in magnesium, so you need to add some magnesium, and you can buy Epsom salts or, or some of the other magnesium products. But it's good to test your soil because you'll see how much you need to add at that point. Um, I see a picture here about the David Austin um, test test of the Duberville. Oh yes, David Austin roses. You can grow some of them in North Florida, but if you're in the Keys, I would stay away from them. They don't like humidity and heat. They would prefer to have some cool nights. They can withstand the summer heat if they have cool nights and they love drip irrigation, but their pH in Key Largo is too high usually. I would try to grow some of the Bermuda roses. Uh, there's a list of Bermuda mystery roses on some on some online and some nurseries sell those and I would suggest sticking with those uh, for Key Largo. Um, I see Fortuniana rootstock, that's a good, it's a good 
observation. A lot of the old garden roses can be grown on their own roots without rootstocks. And that's no exception in Florida. Most of them can be grown here without issues. However, uh, they do do some grafting to enhance the old garden rose, especially in South Florida, where Fortuniana can withstand the heat better. But um, in general, no, you don't need a rootstock for old garden roses. Um, for hybrid teas, you definitely, if you're trying to grow hybrid teas, with the exception of a few hybrid teas, you definitely, definitely need a rootstock there, um, which, which uh, is important. Hey, um, Matt, yes. for the, for the Key Largo question, um, wouldn't it be appropriate yes. for, I think, you know, con containers that for me, the soil there is not adequate and probably container growing would be the best way to go? Yeah, I would say container growing of the shrubs, but even if you grew test of the Dubervilles in a container, it would be too, the climate wouldn't be attractive. It would be too okay. humid and too hot for too long. It likes some dormancy. Uh, she she should stick with the teas. Go look at the tea roses and the chinas. They can grow without going dormant too much. Uh, Madame Anton Mari would be good. Uh, if you have a place for a climber, put it directly in the ground because it can withstand the soils. Bell Portuguese or Fortune's Double Yellow. Some of the uh, China climbers like Cramwell Say Superior uh, and Climbing Old Blush. Uh, some of the no noisette climbers like Reeve d'Or, Chromatella. You can get this the drift. Is a good Those time to talk about Peggy Martin? Peggy Martin, sure. Peggy Martin is an unknown uh, uh, climbing rose that probably relates to the uh, the big uh, growth of rambler roses in the 1890s, but it was found in New Orleans after a huge flood of salt water, and it was still growing, and it withstood all of that, withstood the humid climate. So it's become a big hit across Florida as a climbing rose that blooms all year and enjoys um, our, our climate and, and just kind of doesn't care about the humidity or the heat or anything and does well. Um, Peggy Martin's good, a good one, uh, a good one to grow. Um, let me see if I can get back to here. Okay. So uh, iron deficiency on the youngest leaves, you can see the green veining and the space between the intervenal spaces are yellowed. Nitrogen deficiency, so iron deficiency will only be on new growth, only on the youngest leaves. With nitrogen deficiency, that's a mobile nutrient, so that will only show up on, it'll show up throughout the plant. So if you have the same uh, yellowing throughout the entire plant, you'll know it's a nitrogen deficiency. So, um, you know, we have a lot of wonderful, how much time do I have, Wendy? Um, you have, I would say 10 minutes, um, about 10 minutes. And then probably we're going to about have about 15 minutes worth of questions. Oh, wow. Okay, great. So I want to tell you IPM integrated pest management is important. What you're looking at there is a ladybug larva and that eats aphids. And so it's great to have those in the garden. Um, so the keys for IPM is just know your stuff, know how to identify pests. Um, you know, just 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 try to know what your best control goal is to to control a pest but not harm beneficial insects. That's the main take home message. Um, these are some of the ladybugs that are in a flower trying to eat some aphids off of uh, the flowers. Um, Climate, I mean, think about humidity and temperature, um, natural enemies of our pathogens like uh, assassin bugs and the wheel bug. Um, you know, think about the salt, you know, a lot of these chinas and teas can withstand the salt a lot better than than the hybrids, uh, the hybrid teas uh, and the David Austin. Everyone wants, everyone wants to grow, and they're beautiful roses, the David Austins. Um, there are a few that do well, like Heritage is a nice one that will do well in our area. But I have seen um, results of David Austin roses planted alongside of Belinda's Dream and the Bermuda Mystery roses, and it's night and day. I mean, there, there's a friend of mine's mother who lives here in Vernon, in, in the Vernon area, and she has 
20 or so roses and she grew all the she grew about six david austin roses and then she grew belinda's dream and then she grew the bermuda mystery roses and the tea roses and when i went there on in may i saw she doesn't spray anything fungicide wise and i saw the bermuda mystery and the tea roses fully foliated no disease i saw belinda's dream with a few black spot leaves but nothing major and then i saw some of the david austin roses completely defoliated with black spot um you know so you have to be on a spray program and, and look at the roses that uh, trial and error graham thomas i can think of some of the david austin roses in dothan alabama at the dothan area botanic gardens i'm going to give them a shout out because at the dothan area botanic gardens they have one of the nicest rose gardens in the southeast and i would suggest that you take a look and see what they're growing they can grow Graham Thomas. They can grow uh, Heritage, Mary Rose, um, Abraham Darby. That's about the extent of their English roses and their David Austin roses. Um, and and I would suggest going to see them, going to see the Rose Garden in Lakeland at Florida Southern College. I would suggest seeing that too. It's very nice. And you'll get an idea of what you should be growing. Don't try to grow. I always say don't try to. Don't try to fight nature when you're having a garden. Try to grow plants that, that would do well in your area uh, with and and enjoy what nature has to offer. Uh, native plants. Well, you don't have to go all native. I'm not one of these people that say everyone should be native, uh, growing native plants, but uh, all, oh, exclu exclusively. But they are they should be part of the landscape. But with roses, you could there are plenty that that will do well here. You don't have to fight to try to grow some of the ones that don't. Um, it's just, it just uh, will bring you misery, and you're not going to like them. You're going to get mad at them. And so try to grow some of the roses that do well. Um, you know, this is an example just of black spot, and it, it, it's, it's the spores are in the soil, and they splash on the leaves and germinate. And so if, I know we get lots of rain in Florida, so th th that point of avoiding overhead irrigation, it's a good point, but it might be. A little overused, but I think that it still is a good point. Uh, but um, mulching is another good way to avoid that transfer. Um, so, you know, we talked about these fungal diseases. There are some fungicides available um, to control fungal diseases, such as um, Dacodil, Mancozeb, and uh, Propoconazole. Um, but, um, but in general, you could grow resistant roses and not have to even worry about it. Because spraying is a pain. Because for spray for proper spraying, you have to um, put on a lot of personal protective equipment with gloves and mask and and long long sleeve shirt, long pants. You're out there with a backpack sprayer on with three gallons of water behind you, mixed with sponge aside and you're out there spraying and it's just unless you really like it it's just tedious and you could get away with not having to do it and then of course you're you're killing a lot of your native fungal organisms around your your roses too which there's not a lot of research on if that's a bad thing or not but um to say definitively so i'm not going to go there but you're doing you're, you're basically creating a fungal free environment in a lot of ways. Um, and fungus has important properties for soil nutrient uptake. We do know that. Um, so we have the earth kind roses. Texas A&M has the earth kind list. Those are applicable to most of Florida. Um, and then some of the specific cultivars like Spice, Knockout, Mrs. B.R. Kant, uh, et cetera. Um, we just get a lot of, this is a downy mildew and this will sometimes come on, uh, not too common, but it will show up sometimes and it starts off with this model look, but then later on it will turn. Um, keep an eye out for that. Uh, good air circulation is great for removing downy mildew issues, uh, and, um, early detection is important. Uh, and so, you know, we can remove the infective leaves, do not allow plants to overlap 
and all the water standing. Standing water is bad for causing spread of downy mildew. Um, there are some fungicides. Thank you, Dr. Matthews Parrot, for this slide. Uh, I don't think it's too out of date, um, but you know, it's it's kind of hard to control the downy mildew. Uh, a nice copper fungicide would be good, um, or a soxystrobin, for example. Um, uh, black spot and Zercospora. This is cert black spot. This is um, how it grows throughout the leaves under under the leaf cuticle. You can see it growing there, and uh, it can. It's most. It survives from fifty nine degrees to eighty one. So spring and fall are worst times for black spot. And the the conidia, which is the the spore bearing structure, must be wet for seven hours to infect plant tissues. So stopping cultural control by reducing overhead irrigation, uh, management control, um, getting rid of the infected plant parts such as the leaves and canes. Um, Cercospora is the same way; it's very similar. And so. Um, Fungicides can work. Here are a list of propiconazole, mycobutanol, copper, fungicide, sulfur. Uh, if you're going to spray these, um, keep in mind that resistance can occur, so alternation of methods is good. Uh, here's some more. There's a nice list. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matthews Parrott, again, for the list. Uh, he is the now the chair of the, I believe, plant, which department, plant pathology. I mean, he's been... He's, he used to be the regional uh, diagnostician and uh, pathology specialist for Northeast Florida or North Central Florida. Um, but uh, there are a lot of fungicides available. But you can, like I said, if you, unless you're going to go into exhibition stage, you might not have to worry about fungicides. Gall and it's called ag agrobacterium tumefaciens and and the problem with uh with crown gall is that it can enter a plant through a cut a pruning cut and then go throughout the plant so i've seen a lot of landscape commercial landscapes with infected drift roses because if they prune one when they dis didn't disinfect their shears they spread the bacteria throughout all the planting so it produces this this tumor and it causes the nuclear genome to resequence and grow to these tumor cells in the plant and so the the actual rose tissue becomes that instead of something productive and so the key is to uh, remove infected plants from their environment change the soil and then replant a year later or, or it could be okay if you don't change the soil, you have to wait three years. And the best thing to do is whenever you are pruning your roses with shears, between each rose bush, you need to disinfect your shears with 10% bleach solution or rubbing alcohol, and then you won't have crown gall problems. If your yard is established shears, but if you bring a new plant into the yard, you never know if it's carrying the bacteria. So it's best to disinfect if you have, if you're bringing in new roses. Um, Dr. Malcolm Manners has also, has talked about rose mosaic and rose mosaic is a virus that's transmitted not by gardeners, but by nurseries through propagation of infected material and grafting new roses on an infected rootstock. But Dr. Manners has a way to get rid of rose mosaic in a cultivar. If no clean material is available, they can grow them in a greenhouse or growth chamber at a, over 110 degrees and extract cuttings at the tips and do tissue culture to remove rose mosaic and have clean tissue once again. Uh, some more rose mosaic. And so here we go. If you want to learn more about rose mosaic or to obtain disease-free uh, 
propagation material, you can contact Foundation Plant Services at UC Davis or contact Dr. Malcolm Manners at Florida Southern College. If you want to learn more about rose diseases, you can go to the North Florida Research and Education Center's Pathology U Scout program online. Um, and that's all I have for my presentation. Um, uh, if you would like to learn more about our local Florida nurseries, you can go to the FL FNGLA, Florida uh, Nursery and uh, Landscape and Grower Association. And if you Google Florida Rose Nurseries, you'll find a list. That's the easiest way. Um, if you want to learn about rose history or about rose cultivars in general, there's a website called helpmefind.com slash roses, which is a world a wealth of information. I'm here for questions now. Okay. Um, so uh, Debbie asked for a good list of varieties for zone nine. Um, so I was wondering, uh, but I think you kind of included that in the presentation as we sort of went along. I did, um, but I would say start with Bermuda Spice, Louis okay. Philippe, uh, Bell Portuguese. Uh, there's some of the Cordes, K-O-R-D-E-S, Sunbelt series, which I didn't mention here because they're not old garden roses, but uh, I have a whole other presentation on that. But if you could Google that, they have a website. And uh, the Cordes Sunbelt series might have some good ones that will do well. Um, so, uh, you know, any of the things in the T or, or China class, look up the Earth Kind, Texas Earth Kind roses. When they yeah. were trialed, they were trialed in Zone 9, okay, down in Brownsville area. They were mostly trialed in, in Zone 8B and further north, but... They did have some in South Texas, so you could most of those will work. Um, okay. I don't think Belinda's Dream would be something you'd want to try past Zone Nine B. Zone Nine A would be okay. Okay, um, and you mentioned that these roses oh, OGRs are not normally grown on a rootstock, so we did that. Um, and someone asked about growing roses in pots. Um, you know, do you recommend or do they do better in the ground? Sure, uh, they can be grown in pots, especially roses like Belinda's Dream and some of the tea roses like uh, uh, Madame Anton Mari and some of the polyanthas do very well in pots. Just don't try to grow some of the large tea roses in pots. Um, so if you contact your nursery they, and you want some tea roses to grow in pots, they can recommend some more of the slower growing ones. Um, like Madame what Anton about... Mari is my favorite for a pot. Madame Del Mari. Madame Anton Mari, yeah. Anton Mari, okay. And um, that's a, it's very commonly available. Great. What about growing Don Juan in North Florida or North Central sure. Florida? I would say it's fine for North Florida. And as long as you get plenty of air circulation mm -hmm. and you don't have competition. One thing I've neglected to mention during the presentation is competition from oak roots. Talk about oak it because somebody bags, else wants to know about it. So yeah, uh, oak trees and magnolias will really rob the nutrients from your roses. So if you can plant them away from the oaks, if you can't, the one thing to do, you could dig, if you have your rose beds, which I have I have not done this, but I should have, uh, if you dig a trench and then put down some barrier three feet deep, um, uh, some, some root barrier, and then you fill it back in or on the on the two sides of your rose bed so the oak or the side where the oaks are so they can't go through um uh, i have grown roses with issues from oaks and i will say that the teas and the chinas can fight the oak trees and they can win okay okay and for still have a nice rose bush but some of the other roses, like I've seen issues with Knockout, with Belinda's Dream, with the oak trees um, in my own yard, and roses grafted onto Fortuny and a hybrid teas that just can't fight the oaks um, in their root systems. However, roses like the old gardens, like I keep talking about, like the spice rose, Bermuda spice, um, uh, there's another one called um, Monster to the Yay. There's 
uh, quite a few, just tea and China classes, they just can tend to fight those oak roots because they're vigorous, you know, yeah. and the noisettes too can fight the oaks. Uh, what do you think about the, what is the Seven Sisters Rose? Sure, I, it, Seven Sisters is a multiflora rambler. So it was bred from Rosa multiflora. And is it, it the grow. one that it only blooms once a year? It does. It only blooms once a year for about six to six to eight weeks. Matt, ain't nobody got time for a rose that only blooms once a year. That makes me crazy. People like it because it, the, the flowers change colors from like yeah. red, light pink to red and all. But it, it's it's easy to grow. So if you just put it somewhere in the corner and enjoy it flowering once a year and then just let it be green the rest of the year. Okay. Um, what's the best time to uh, propagate uh, rose cuttings? Oh, perfect. There's two times. So uh, we're getting into one of the best times right now. Uh, in the in the so if you're going to do a semi hardwood cutting right now, you could actually take some cuttings uh, from your last. So go in November right before we're, we may get a frost in November or December, and uh, take some cuttings and then uh, pop them up and into a uh, a well drained but a well drained mixture that holds water uh, at a me medium level and then just put them in a cool dark location outside not cool dark a cool shady location outside and then when you do that uh, you just keep them moist let them alone and let them be cool and they're going to slowly 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 put roots down and so hopefully by April, we'll have rooted plants. That's one thing. Oh, thank you so much for saying that, Matt. I've always given up. I you sh So don't give up, you're saying. Go for months if, if as necessary. As long as they stay green. Yeah. If they, if they turn black, give up. Okay. Because they're dead. Fantastic. That's great information. But I, I'm, the, I'm learning but something. I, I did that myself one time, and I ended up taking forever, but it worked. The other thing in the summer, not the summer, but I mean around April, you could take the first new new first or second flushes new growth and you know you'd what you do the same thing but you'd put a cover on it like a a, a coke bottle or plastic bag or something a, that would stay up and it'd make a greenhouse okay and then you'll have a quick rooting uh softwood okay. cutting which would root within a month all right um uh, someone's asking about deer there aren't any resistant varieties are there no what you can do is plant deer unfriendly plants around your house and then plant the roses closer so the, the barrier would be there for deer. So if you have some, some, ro some oh, some, some, uh, you know, the old Buford holly, they hate those things. Um, another thing is if you, if you really, if you were, I'm getting into that in Dallas, uh, being the ag agent, I'm going to be doing a seminar on deer unfriendly plants, what to plant around your property to deter deer. Right. And one thing is a nice dose of that Smilax briar, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's native. And it's a native plant, and it produces flowers that our native insects love, and also produces berries you can use to dye clothing. And and birds love the berries. Birds love the so. berries, but if you get them going, someone's asked me why would you ever plant smilax? Well, exactly, that, everyone's if, asking why would you plant smilax? <laughs> if you get, if you have a garden and you just can't keep the deer out, if you plant it dense around the borders, and 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 then you garden in between the, those the, those borders, that will deter them. Um, and there's some other plants on the Texas list which I can't remember, but uh, they're they're coming up with a list of deer deterrent plants now okay. over there. So Matt, what is your opinion on the fertilizer, like the the combo products, fertilizer mixed with fungicide, mixed with you know they have these these combo products for roses for spraying. First of all, for old garden roses, we shouldn't be spraying. But what is your opinion on these combo products? The combo products can, are not a, they're not going to be the um, catch all to cure black spot, um, or no, nothing really cures it, but to prevent it, it'll help. They can help in the process, but Combo products in general, they make things easier, but they can also complicate things because uh, they can kill beneficial insects and also with the insecticide added, can be toxic to bees when they're in flower, possibly, depending on which fungicides, which insecticide is used. So you have to read the label to see if it's toxic to honeybees. And our native bees are in danger. You know, we need to be careful um, because of overuse of pesticides harming our native bee population. 
we have what, over 600 species of native bees here in, mm -hmm. in Florida. And then another thing to watch out for is sometimes you can get de develop if it's one type of fungicide in that combo, uh, you could, they can develop um, resistance to the uh, disease. So yes, I course. would prefer to apply something separately. Yeah, we, we, you know, that's not IPM. The combination products is not what we recommend for IPM. Exactly. Um, so uh, let's see. Um, could you mention again um, the garden in Lakeland and then a few of the nurseries? And you sure. went kind of fast last time. So watch your words oh, I and did. kind I, of really spell it out. I tried not okay? I tried to be slow, but it just doesn't work. I'm just not, not built that way, I guess, um, uh, in my speech. So I would say that Florida Southern College in Lakeland with Dr. Malcolm Manners. He is a very wonderful person. I I and was saddened when I heard someone went in his garden and stole roses from them this oh. last spring. But uh, they uh, but they have a wonderful selection of roses and they're they have a sale once a year. And if you talk to Dr. Manners, he's he's very nice fellow and sometimes they share cuttings, but I would go to the sales that they have because that helps them generate funding to maintain the garden it's called ruth it's called ruth's rose garden is a name and and that's a really good place uh you also have your nurseries uh so there's three main nurseries please nurseries don't get mad at me if i'm leaving you out but i'm just going off the top, top of my head here okay so the three main nurseries i'm aware of that are selling in florida are angel gardens um then Rose Petals Nursery, Angels Gardens is in Alachua County. And then you have Rose Petals Nursery in Williston. And then you have a Reverence for Roses down near Oak, I believe Ocala. They're the three that are dealing mostly in old garden roses, but you also have Nelson's Florida Roses, which they do Fortuniana grafted roses and they do sell some old garden roses as well as some of the shrubs. They're mostly hybrid teas, but uh, and the hybrid teas are beautiful if you can spray, but um, uh, but the if you're trying to do a sustainable landscape, you want to stick with the shrubs and the old garden roses. So those are the four main ones. Uh, and uh, there's also cool roses, C O O L roses. They're in, in near uh, Fort Lauderdale, and they may sometimes do old garden roses too. So that's another one. Okay, um, let's see. Um... Someone mentioned that they were having great success with roses and earth boxes, which doesn't surprise me. Which sure, that makes weird. sense. Um, as as and, long as they're not the crazy ones that get huge, you know, because then you about, end up. What would you say is the best time of year to plant a rose? I would say uh, fall, uh, fall would be the best. And the second best would be spring. Like uh, October is the best month to plant roses. And the second best month would be March. Okay. And then my rule of thumb, Matt, has been for years, prune like crazy around Valentine's Day and then prune like crazy again in, uh, around Labor Day. Would you agree with that? Well, it depends on the roses. So if they're shrub roses, yes. But if you're growing tea roses, T-E-A roses, uh -huh. some of them hate being pruned ever. And if you did really? that, you would kill them. Yes. Okay. So if you're growing some of the old-fashioned tea roses, they just like a light snip once in a while, and it's and a, a light snip around Valentine's Day and removal of dead or crossing branches, and uh, they're happy, uh, and and they don't really care to be pruned too heavy. Okay, Noisettes so... don't mind, but the teas, noisettes and chinas and shrubs like Belinda's Dream prune away. But if you're polyanthus, you can prune them like crazy. But if and they like it, but if you're growing tea roses, they're they're bred for Rosa gigant, uh, Gigantea and some of the others, and they do not. There's something in their genetics where they adver are adverse to pruning, and you can ruin a beautiful tea rose by pruning it, and it'll never recover. They they grow on very old wood, and they they their new growth comes from higher. Instead of the new growth coming from the base. They like to produce new growth higher up in the canopy on the on the stems, and you can get some canes, some massively large canes that will produce newer growth. And so, pruning them higher up is advisable. And I would just would just shave them a little bit. And the one I I loved called Madam, 
Antoine Mari, again, I'll bring that one up. Loves to be in containers. But also, if you if you have a properly pruned one at about four foot tall, it almost looks like a bonsai. The structure of it, the woody structure, can get very beautiful. And then you can get lichens and moss growing on the old bark. And it'll mm -hmm. start shedding bark uh, once it's about 20 years old. I've seen some older plants of this rose that could be spectacular. Great. Good. Um, and as far as websites go, what would you recommend? Um, again? Uh, Earth Kind Roses, Texas Earth Kind Roses, the UF IFAS publications on roses. Uh, website helpmefind.com slash roses is a searchable database of all known rose cultivars, including now some from China that have been discovered and bred for, and the new ones that are being bred in India. Um, and they're, some of those are in the, available in the USA too. And the climate in India is so similar to South Florida, you could grow a lot of his. Uh, uh, the one that sells his roses um, would be um, Roses Unlimited out of South Carolina. Um, and a lot of these nurseries have, uh, oh, another nursery that just came online is Freedom Gardens. I forgot to mention them. Freedom? But, uh, a lot of these nurseries have garden days where you can tour their gardens. And uh, those are highly recommended if you can. Um, so, and contact the nurseries. A lot of them are small businesses that are owned by, you know, a family. They're not, in general, a lot of these old garden nurseries are not big corporations. So contacting the owners, um, you know, they might not get back to your email within a week, you know, so, you know, contact the owners and, and with a phone call and, and get to know them and, and work with them. Um, they Some try of these places you have to get work. on a list or, you know, they have to know you want it and yeah. then they'll either yeah, it for you or be get a waiting for list you. for a certain rose, yeah. you know? And right. uh, that's like anti Gross Emporium. They routinely sell out and they keep restocking and they're a big company. But some of these other people aren't as big, you know. You might have right. um, like Rose Petals Nursery. It's run by a few people and they they were a stock. But if you call them up, call Sydney Wade and say, hey, look, I'm looking for this rose. Can you help me out? And a lot of times you have a little one, you know, started and she can put your name on it, you know. Um, right. Yeah. Sydney's good people. She's a nice lady. Um, hey, yeah. Matt, this is personally for me, and then we're going to sign off because uh, I know you've got a lot of stuff to sure. do. Um, what, uh, yeah, I'm trying for, to sell my oh, house here. Okay. Does anybody need a house in Washington? In Chipley, County? Florida. In Chipley, Florida. Um, <laughs> what, uh, for, as far as fragrance, what would you recommend for Old Garden Rose, the best fragrance? Mm, that's a great question. Okay. So, it was my fra for favorite fragrance for for a honey scent would be a blush noise scent, okay, by far. Okay. And uh also Pearl de Or. Pearl de Or, uh, okay. Pearl de Or. Uh, and and then some people say Belinda's there's a genetic, there is a known genetic factor with Belinda's dream. For about half the population, it has a beautiful, wonderful rose scent. And for half the population, it's scentless. Okay. It's based on your genetics of your olfactory sensory nerves or whatever. And then uh for Bourbon roses, um, Maggie is nice. Um, okay. Souvenir de la Malmaison is nice for a really strong scent. And if you're wanting to get into the intensive scents, you have to go beyond the old garden roses that we can grow because a lot of the really, really strong scented ones can be grown only north of zone seven because oh, they like a lot of cold. You. Um, but there is some old hybrid tea called Crimson Glory Climbing, which is stronger scented than Don Juan and can thrive in, if it's in the right microclimate, can thrive in Florida without too much worry. worry. Uh, get the climbing version of Crimson Glory Climbing, because the bush version is weak and small, but they have okay. an intense scent. It's the strongest it's probably the strongest scented rose ever developed. Crimson Glory okay. Climbing. Okay, Crimson Glory Climbing. I just want to be able to pick a few roses from the garden, bring it into the house and walk into the room and say, oh, I have roses in the room. You know, it's been a while since I've been able to do that. So, 
Uh, Matt, we wish you all the luck in the world out in Texas. We miss you already. Um, our loss is certainly their gain, and um, I wish you good luck and and your I'm transition. I'm looking forward to all that we can do. There. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to working with Florida agents and and collaborating. And you know, we're all in the same climate, and a lot of the states, if Florida and Texas are in the same zone, so we there's a lot we can do together. So uh, Lisa asked this one question. I'm going to answer her, sure. and I want you to follow up. Um, Lisa said, if you're having trouble identifying a rose at home, what would you recommend? And, of course, we're going to recommend the Rose Society. Your local Rose Society will have – they have consulting rosarians that will help you mm -hmm. with this. And, Matt, That's could you really speak good. a little more about this? So they – with the American Rose Society, they can – they have local Rose Societies all over the country – and so there's consulting rosarians that have gone through testing uh, and and uh, courses to uh, courses and testing to become that status. And they have to be have been growing roses for many years, and at least three years. And they uh, uh, and so that they they have some knowledge on identification and care of roses for your local area. So I would definitely speak with those. You'll get two different kinds of rose gardeners, and sometimes they're like me, where they they grow all kinds of roses. Uh, but they are the show rose people or the old garden rose people, okay? And you're you're going to get different answers depending on who you talk to. So if you grow, if you're growing, talking to show rose people, they're going to want you to grow the long stem florist style rose and do those methods, okay? Or you have the garden people, landscape people, who want you to grow the old garden roses in your landscape. So make sure you talk to the people that are kind of aligned to your uh, your style of gardening. Perfect. Perfect. That's the best thing. And another thing is for identifying roses, helpmefind.com. Oh, there's also uh, Rose Chat on Facebook. It's a group called Rose Chat. And they are great at identifying roses. Some of the best and most knowledgeable rosarians in the world are on Rose Chat. And I'm not joking. It's to the truth. And there are cool. some people that might have over a thousand different cultivars in their garden in california and they if anyone can identify rose it's them rose chat i just always text you and so yeah if you need a, if you need a rose <laughs> id just email Send me, me an and email. i'll text matt I, I put my email in there in the chat um i'll put it again uh it's uh yeah you can email me i'm i'm an extension agent and we always love our little multi-state endeavors um yep you know, we always help each other out as an extension, right? no matter what state or country we're in. Yeah. It's a family, so we always ask for family favors. Right. So here we are, and um, you're always welcome to, if you're in Dallas, stop by. We have at the at the uh, Dallas Research Center, which is about 10 miles from my office, they actually have roast trials there from Dr. Dr. Steve George. And he's done, he's the mastermind of the earth kind program. So, Fantastic. and there's trials all over the, the, the county and Good. including some master gardener trials that are at the farm where I have my ag orchard, my fruit orchard. Um, so I'm going to do this real quick for somebody. I'm copy, recopying your email. So Matt, just as an aside, who, have you met any of the master gardeners in Dallas? I have. And I'm not the coordinator. I'm the coordinator of the Master Naturalist group now. I know. But yes, I have. There's some really nice ones. I know. Really accomplished oh, okay. Master Gardeners. Fantastic. Maybe we and can all I'll get together And i tell you what, sometime. Master Gardeners are great. They run. We have the, the horticulture farm there, and it's a fruit and vegetable and uh, fruit orchard and vegetable farm. And the Master Gardeners put in all the labor to keep that going. Wow. Even though it's considered a community ag farm and it's growing a lot of produce, it's also a master gardener project and so they actually are helping the ag agent not just the horticulture agent perfect perfect so all right my friend i miss you and i hope to see you real soon miss you okay too. well we'll see you at the national meeting in dallas next yes year. you will all right friend take care bye-bye thanks yes. thank you take care bye-bye thank you